Welcome to the next installment of the LV Mastery Tip Jar. We've entitled this installment, It's All About Timing. And we're going to talk about two fundamental things. First are the timing functions built into LabVIEW. And we're going to take a short diversion into some of the OpenG extensions of those functions. Timing is fundamentally important within LabVIEW. Because of its inherent parallelism, you have a lot of very sophisticated behaviors which you can get almost for free when you're coding. And this can also be a real problem when you're not intending or expecting to have parallelism. And this is very often the case when trying to debug a program. Typically, problem will be a result of timing. And when you see it when you're running it with breakpoints or with execution highlighting turned on, problems go away. And then as soon as you run it full speed, it occasionally will fail. And that's very often a timing related problem. Let's begin by taking a look at the timing subpalette. There are three fundamental functions here. The first is the tick count, the next is wait, and the third is wait until next millisecond multiple. There's often confusion between these two functions, and we'll get to that in a moment. First, let's talk about the tick count. It returns a value which is an unsigned integer representing the millisecond timer value. Essentially, there's a timer going on behind the scenes which is keeping track of absolute time in milliseconds. Using this function, we can read that timer value and make decisions as to when we should do certain things, if we so desired. The next function is the wait function. You see that this has an input, which is milliseconds to wait. And when this function executes, it will, not surprisingly, wait for a certain number of milliseconds. Also, it has an output, which is actually the time of the millisecond timer when the delay is finished. The third function is wait until next millisecond multiple. It has the same input and the same output as the wait millisecond. The difference is its behavior. It is probably easiest to demonstrate this with an example. Let's start on our front panel and we'll create a numeric control. We'll just call it milliseconds to wait. And because we know these functions take an input of a U32, let's change that representation now. So let's put down from our timing palette the wait function. And what we're going to do is just put a little format into string at the end of that, just reporting for us the very simple formatting here. The timer value is now percent %d, which is going to format that u32 into a string representation of that number, and we'll put down a single button dialog box to pop up when we're done. So if we tell this thing to wait, say, 2500 milliseconds, when we run it, after very close to 2.5 seconds, we see the timer value is now 11794.85. Okay, let's change that now from the wait millisecond to the wait until next millisecond multiple. We're going to do something further. We're going to change the timing to be 100 milliseconds. We're going to change our pop-up to be a two-button dialog. We'll change our message to be wait again. And we'll put the whole darn thing in a while loop. In this case, if someone pushes true, they want to run again, so we'll change that to be continue if true. So observe what happens when we run this. The timer value is now 1241401. So pay close attention to the last three digits. It's 401, 700, 100, 701, 201. We cancel it, it stops. If we change this millisecond to wait to be 1,000, and we run it. 4,000, 7,000, and 1, 9,001. So what's happening here is we can see because this is the wait until millisecond multiple, it's not stopping after exactly 1,000 milliseconds. It's stopping at a time when it is very close to a multiple of that number. So what this means is if we had some additional code sitting inside here that say took 250 milliseconds to execute. If we had this function in place, which is the wait until millisecond multiple, the entire loop would still function at the rate of 1000, even though there's other stuff in the loop that's taking extra time. If instead, and I'll just cancel this, we put this back to the wait, 
then there is nothing forcing it to be a multiple of that thousand. And we see that the last four digits of our tick count are randomized, essentially. And if this were the situation where there was some code after the delay which took 250 milliseconds, now the entire loop would run and it would take 1,250 milliseconds. So, in summary, when you have a loop that you want to run at a fixed rate, even though there's other stuff happening inside it, you use the wait until millisecond multiple. If you just want to delay, which is of a fixed length, then you would use the wait millisecond, as we see here. So let's modify this example again. Let's get rid of our prompt, replace our dialog box with the one button dialog, remove our while loop. What we want to do is we want to perform two delays sequentially, both of which popping up at the end. So here we've got code which is going to, if we were just to see it again, run it, wait one second, pop up, give us the timer value and say OK. Well, let's do two of these. So we select our code, we drag it with our control key pressed, we get a second copy. And it may be pretty obvious if I run this now, I'm not going to get the desired behavior, which would be to have one delay followed by the second delay. What's going to happen now is we have the two delays happening at the same time and two pop-ups coming up at the same time. So this is a very simple review of data flow programming techniques. How would we modify this so that we had our delays being sequential? Well, we must remember that whenever we have data flow programming, it doesn't depend on the position on the diagram, it doesn't depend on data flow from left to right or up to down, it depends on two basic fundamental behaviors. The first is, no function executes until data is at all of its inputs, and second, data does not come out of its outputs until a function is complete. What this means from the point of view of creating two sequential delays with pop-ups is we need a way to sequence this set of functions with this set of functions. And the most common way to do that is using the sequence structure. So we have access to the flat sequence structure. Okay, if we were to create a frame after, then we can expand that frame and just simply drag our second code inside it. And now when we run this, not surprisingly, we're going to get our first delay, followed by our second delay and our second pop-up. Now a very common timing function to perform is to determine how long a certain sub-VI or a certain function took to execute. So one way to do that is to use and subtract the tick counts before and after a function executes. So that's where the third timing function, which we haven't really talked about, comes into play quite often, which is the tick count function. All that this guy does is return the tick count. It doesn't do a delay, it doesn't perform any action, it just simply returns the value of the timer at that moment. So what we want to do now is let's modify this pop-up. We're going to remove this delay and say it took you percent %d milliseconds to push that button. 